Okay, this will now begin part two of the interview with Timothy J. Gamash. It is September 6, 2012. We're at the Willard Hall Studio at Central Connecticut State University in New Britain, Connecticut. The interviewer is Owen Rogers, and the interview is being conducted with the Veterans History Project. Now, I believe the question we left off on was, well, we'll start this with a little bit of humor. Um, do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events that you experienced while you were in country? Uh, or basic training, it's all. Uh, humorous, yeah. We had a uh, new commander, if you were a new detachment leader, come in. He was a uh, JG, Lieutenant JG. And he's, he's like a lot of other JGs, you know what I mean? When they arrive on a scene, it's, I'm here now and everything is going to be uh, different. You know, they want to make a name for themselves or whatever. Butter bars. Yep, butter Well, yeah, that, that same thing as a butter bar in the Army, okay? I just happened to be pulling the duty of cleaning out the grease trap outside of the galley. Now, this is a nasty job because you actually have to climb into the trap with a fire hose and blow the obstruction out of the outlet side of the trap, whatever it might be, okay? So I'm in there and i am got all the grease floating around, all of the grapefruit halves and banana peels and whatever, okay? Yeah, you know, I, I did it because I didn't want to ask some uh, lower ranking guy to do it because I knew it was a nasty jab. I figured, oh, you know, I'll just do it and get it over with. Here comes the JG. He's walking down the boardwalk, and it's pitch black outside. It's dead of night. Now, the boardwalk is something that we built uh, for the monsoon season so that you could didn't have to walk through the mud everywhere you went. You stayed on the boardwalk, you get into your hooches without getting mud all over you or whatever. Here he comes down the boardwalk. I see him walking toward me. I, I, I purposely took a grapefruit half and put it on top of my head, a couple of banana peels and put them on my shoulders and waited for him to get close enough to me. I stand up and I salute him. Good evening, sir. Okay. I, he went screaming into the night because he didn't know if I was man or beast. Just a little welcome to Vietnam, JG, you know? Okay. So, what was the other one? We actually commandeered an Arvin armored personnel carrier. Uh, an M113 like ours? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, same as ours. Same as ours. Yeah, because their equipment was our equipment, if you will. Um, we commandeered this thing from them and started to drive it up and down the streets of Mito, firing off the 50 caliber machine gun. <clears throat> Needless to say, we were all pretty well inebriated. And I dare say, if we had ever gotten caught, we were, we were in some deep trouble. And what else did we do? Sick lows. Oh, the Jeep? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting tips over here. Uh, I drove a Jeep into the bay one time. Bay? No, this was down in Dongtam, okay? I hadn't been allowed to go into Mito and uh, relieve the tension, okay, in uh, quite some time. And when they refused to let me have a, a Jeep again... Uh, I had spent just enough time at the EM club. I said, you know what? Screw them. I'm going to go. And I grabbed myself a Jeep, and I'm heading towards Mito. Now, there's a, you hit a T in the road. You go left, you go to Mito. You go right, you go out to the end of a pontoon pier. Okay. Now, I knew how to get to Mito. I had been down that road probably hundreds of times prior to this. But in the shape I was in, for don't ask. I decided to take a right, and uh, because it was dark, I proceeded to drive this Jeep right off the end of the pontoon pier, right on, into the bay itself, and I'm sitting at the, in the Jeep with my hands on the wheel while the Jeep is 
sinking into the bay. So I, you know, I got, I obviously, I got out of the Jeep and I got myself back to the barracks, back to the hooch. The next day, very next day, I might add, at first formation, they're asking if anybody knows where Jeep number 8648, whatever happens to be, because they're looking for it. And I am saying to myself, I know exactly where it is, but I have no intention of telling you where it is. That's what happens when you get a little, a little too drunk. And uh, rice wine. I used to have rice wine in Vietnam. This stuff it came in little, uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember Pal Soda. Okay. But it came in little, I want to say seven, eight ounce bottles. Okay. This rice wine looked just like an old Pal bottle. It had, all it had on it was a little white circle with a red tiger head in the middle of it. Right. And I swear, you drank two bottles of this stuff, you were having a conversation with God, and he was talking back to you, okay? This stuff was out there. And we talked to a couple of the Ciclo drivers. Now, a Ciclo is a canopied seat being propelled by a bicycle. It's like a rickshaw, but it's a bicycle. And the bike is in the back pushing the seat along, okay? They call them Ciclos. We talked to drivers into taking five dollars a piece from us, me and Joe Hogan, the guy I mentioned before, then we would drive them around. So they had no problem with that. They took our five dollars, you know. What they didn't know, what we had in mind was we were going to play chicken. So Joe gets down the other end of the road, and I stay there, and I wait for him to turn around. As soon as he turns around, we start playing chicken. Okay? Now, we did all right first few times, you know what I mean? We each, each went the opposite direction. Now the local indigenous type personnel, they're all starting to gather up in the balconies because they, they've never seen anybody play chicken with cyclos before, right? So they're all watching this. And every time we would miss, you'd hear like a murmur, you know, something like that, right? First time we screwed up, both went the same way and crashed into one another, right? They're cheering, they're throwing flowers. <laughs> Look at that, you people. You don't even know what chicken is. You know, what is the matter with you? Right? Of course, the driver now, he's trying to give us the five dollars back. We're telling him, forget it, pal. You know? but, but there was one other occasion that I would not call it funny, but it's one I won't forget. I'm in there, I'm outside, shower, cleaning up, shaving. And this guy who hadn't been there very long, all right, he's on guard duty. And I look in the mirror, and I see this guy raise his weapon, point it at my head, squeeze the trigger, because I heard the hammer fall, okay? And he starts to laugh like it was a big joke. Well, I threw the razor in the sink. I went outside the shower, and I proceeded to wrap that weapon around his head a few times, okay? Uh, next thing you know, the both of us are in the CEO's office, wants to know what happened, whatever. I just, I just, this guy thought it would be quite amusing to point his weapon at the back of my head and squeeze the trigger. I said, I, I didn't find it all that amusing, sir. You know, he told me I was, I'm dismissed, told me to go on my way. And I dare say, I don't know what happened to this guy, but nobody ever saw him again. He, he was gone the next day. I have no idea. I found out later on that it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I guess he had... Had a few other incidents on his record, too. So my guess is uh, he was either in Long Bend Jail or, you know, on his way stateside or something. But they, they pulled him out of there in a hurry. But fun times. i tell you the one thing we used to do in the monsoons that was, believe it or not, it was a lot of fun was play football in the rain and in the mud. That was an absolute blast, Okay. The reason for that is you, you really can't get hurt because nobody can really get a head of steam up to, to tackle you, you know, and everybody's slipping and slide. And it was a really good way to blow off some steam, you know what I mean? So we, we, we'd be surprised how can creative you can get when you need to blow off some steam, you know what I mean? So, but uh, we knew how to do it. You know, sometimes you drank, sometimes you got high, sometimes you play football in the rain, you know. You found a way. You had to do it, though. You had to do it because if you didn't find a way to blow off steam, man, you're going to be ready for a padded room in no time. Speaking of which, do you recall any pranks that you or your fellow servicemen would pull on each other? 
Short cheated a lot of people. Yeah, that was fun. We used to do that a lot. Yeah. How so? Huh? Uh, cards or? No, no, short sheet. You take their, what you do is you pull back their blanket, right? Pull back the top sheet, take the bottom sheet, and fold it in half and then tuck it under it again. So when they get in the bed, they pull back their blanket, the top sheet, and they go to put their feet in there, okay? They... They smash their toes into the into the bottom sheet because it's it's folded in half. They can't extend their legs all the way out. Or we had a double bunk with one guy uh, inside the hooch. There were a couple of double bunks. Most of it was all single bunk. But one guy there, he was a bit of a hero. You know, he was going to win the war all by himself and whatever. Okay, uh, he came back from the EM club. What we did was we took his mattress out took the springs out and just looped his blanket and sheets around the frame itself and laid his pillow on it. So there was nothing underneath the, but just the, the sheets and the blanket all tucked in, right? So here he comes. He was one of what we call a high jumper. You know, they grabbed the bottom bar and they throw themselves up into the rack. Okay. Now he came back from the EM club having to shoot grabbed the bar, threw himself up there, and we were right there to take a picture of him as he was like halfway between the top rack and the bottom rack. And we put 8 by 10 glossies all over the, all over the barracks of him with this rather scared look on his face. There's always ways to bring somebody down to ground level. Yeah. What did you think of your officers and your fellow servicemen? You know... Officers are, it's, I, there's, I say I disliked more officers than enlisted people, but like any other profession, you have good ones and you have bad ones, okay? First off, the ones that, uh, Mustangers, I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase, but Mustangers are, they come all the way up through. They, they start as enlisted people, E1s, and they work their way all the way up through the ranks, okay? These are invariably your very best officer because they've been through everything that you have been through as an enlisted person, okay? So they have a greater appreciation for what you have to do, what's required of you at that level, okay? OCS were the worst, Officers Candidate School, because they just, they didn't have any leadership skills, okay? At least not, not that I could observe anyway, let's put it that way. Um, and they skipped over being an NCO? A lot of OC, a lot of them came right out of college. They come out of college, they go to OCS, they become officers. You know, they go through a very brief, basic training, and they stick them out there in charge of people. You know, nine times out of ten, they don't have the kind of... Leadership is an acquired trait, okay? You're not... You are born with it to a degree, but to get to have really good leadership skills... That's an acquired ability. You know, you don't just come out of the shoot and you're a great leader. You know, you gotta learn how to do that type of thing. And these, they haven't had the experience. And, and that's the best thing you can have is experience because you come, what, you're in college one day, six months later, you're you're in charge of people and you're, you're wearing officer's insignia. Now, six months isn't fair, more like a year, but still, you know, you don't have the experience of leading people, especially stateside is one thing. You know, under combat conditions, that's the, now you're now you're talking about a whole different ball of wax. You, know, you the men that you have under your charge, you've got to be able to believe in you because they have to follow your orders. And if they think your orders are bogus, well, everybody's going to get hurt. Everybody's going to get hurt. You know, you got to be able to believe in that person who's in charge. How about you, the enlisted men that you serve with? I'm sorry? How about the enlisted men that you served with? What was your opinion about that? I'll tell you what. Like I said before, I served in two branches. I served in Navy Seabees, Army Reserve. I retired after 20 and a half years in 1997. And the one thing that I missed the most from my military experience are the people that I served with. Great people. Good character. People who, for lack of a better way, get it. You know, you know, it's to me, 
Service is what it's all about, you know what I mean? When you serve something greater than yourself, now you get it. Did you keep a journal while you were overseas? I'm sorry? Did you keep a journal while you were overseas? No. Just a short timer's calendar. That's all I wanted to have. Now Everybody had one of those. But you extended it for six months? Yep. I did that so, like I say, I could get uh, a six-month cut on my enlistment. That was, the, that was the only reason I really did that. Well, that, that like I said before, in Vietnam, I was doing what I was trained to do, you know. And, I, and the, the wealth of experience that I was getting there, I knew I wasn't going to get that stateside. So I was better off staying right there, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was, some nights were pretty hairy, you know what I mean? But it's all part of it. Now you came back to serve in the reserves. Did you ever consider being a lifer in the Navy? <laughs> you remind me of another little story. I, I ran into a guy in the Navy. True story. This guy ran special services at Cameron Bay. Now, what that means is this is the guy who handed out goggles, snorkels, swim fins, beach umbrellas to people who wanted to go to the beach at Cameron Bay. This is what he did. He was an E6 Probably had four or five people in his charge. He and he was a lifer. You know? He was an E6. E6. First class petty officer. And I said to him, I said, I'm still young, dumb. And I said, how in the world can you stay in the Navy for 20 years? Are you crazy or what, right? Now, when, when he initially gave me the answer to this question, didn't really sink in, okay? It was only later on that I kind of grasped it, okay? His answer to me was, and I quote, Hey, pal, it beats working for a living. And later on, when I thought about it, here I am, mean, he's, he's in Vietnam. He's in E6. He shows up at 8 o'clock in the morning for, for muster at 8 o'clock in the morning. He comes back at 1600, makes sure all his people are there. And that's all he does all day long. And he's in Cameron Bay. He's never going to fire around in anger. He's never going to have a round in anger fired at him. I said to myself, yeah, I think I could do that for 20 years. You know what I mean? You know, so. But like I said, when he first told me that, I didn't, I didn't quite grasp it. You know? So where were you did your service ended in the Navy? My active duty service did, yes. Okay. Where was I when I ended? Yes. Port Wayne. I was only in two places, either Fort Wayne or Vietnam. That was it. And uh, what was your home? Or, oh. or uh, Naval Air Station Point Magoo, Red Line Marine Corps, Hard Labor Break. I spent about 16 days in that place, too. Should I tell you about that? Is that, <laughs> is that just the transitionary area? Or? No, 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 no. I was, I, was, I was thrown in the brig for violating a few rules. And drinking as a minor... Unauthorized possession of an ID card and assault and battery on a petty officer all on the same night got me 16 days in a Marine Corps break. What was that? I have spent one day in jail since. Let's just say it was an eye opener. You That's know what I mean? Great. Yeah, nothing like having your freedoms ripped from you, man, to uh, help you see the light, if you know what I'm saying. So, um,. How did you feel the day of your discharge from the Navy? You know what? It, it, I'd rather go back to how I felt when I left Vietnam. What was your okay? Home, what was your homecoming like? Or, it, it, well, let me, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Let me just get to that in a second, okay? I likened my departure from Vietnam to a scene I saw in MASH mm -hmm. when radar leaves. Okay, he's standing in the middle of the compound, and it's time for him to go, okay? But he's torn, because he knows, I gotta keep my emotions in check here. He's probably never gonna see these people again that he has fought with, kept people alive with, and gone through absolute hell with. You know, that creates a bond like, that's stronger than family, okay? 
And he's never going to see any of these people probably ever again. So here you are. You know what I mean? I was the same way when I when I get when I got to get onto that plane, that freedom bird, as we used to call it. Okay, that's where I found myself because I wasn't going to see any of these guys probably ever again. And I went through stuff that I, you know what I mean? I, I couldn't imagine I would even survive. And uh, some of them, they're the reason why I did survive. Okay, and it's a couple of occasions. I mean, they're the reason why I'm here. Okay. And yet, the other half of me says, Timmy, get on that bird. Get the hell out of here, you know? That's, that's a tough place because you're being pulled in two, two different directions, okay? As far as my homecoming goes, I arrived at Seattle-Tacoma, okay? They call it SeaTac Airport. And we got greeted with a couple of things there. There were college co-eds there that were had taken dog shit put it into plastic bags and put that in brown paper bags and were throwing the bags at the troops as they come off the plane and then there was uh, a gentleman there who was an American legionnaire which I have to this kills me because I am an Amer I am I'm a member of the American Legion now, you know. And back at that time, this guy is standing there. He's got his hat on, all his little pins, and he's screaming at us coming off the plane, calling us baby killers and losers. And this guy is surrounded by MPs. And I made a statement to one of the MPs that you know I just I, th <laughs> I think it's a good thing you guys are watching this guy, you know. And I'll never forget the answer he gave me, man. He looked me right in the eye and told me, he said, if I had my way, I'd let you have them. When I looked at him, I said, understood, you know. But that was in California, okay. Now, when I got out of the service and I came back home to Connecticut, okay, first I should tell you, when I, when I got leave from home, to come home from Vietnam, got 30 days of liberty when he got out, or came home from Vietnam. I always went to work when I came home. I wasn't going to do anything during the daytime anyway. I figured I'd make myself a few dollars while I'm there. And my father was working at Hartford Hospital at the time. And, you know, he, he finagled it so that I could work over there while I was home on leave. Well, the first day we got there, my father spent the entire day, I'm talking about eight solid hours, Walking around a job, introducing me to everybody. This is my son. He just came back from Vietnam. Now, my dad was not your pat him on the back kind of guy. Okay, he had a boys who weren't even part of the program when it came to my father. Okay, and when we were riding home from from the job that day, I started thinking to myself, I said, Jesus. And when we got home, I said something to him about it, too. I said, you know what, Dad? I said, let me ask you a question. You don't think that we were sitting a bar kind of high, man, for me to earn your respect? I mean, I had to go get my ass shot at in order to earn, earn your respect. Isn't that sitting a bar a little high? And he thought about that. You know, my father was a crusty old guy, and I didn't want to admit he's wrong, neither. You know what I mean? So, But he thought about that for a few moments, and then he looked at me and goes, yeah, you're right. He said, I probably did set the bar a little high there. I goes, yeah. I think you did too, you know. But when I came back to Bristol, when I off my active duty, okay, one thing about Bristol, I've learned this even more so as chairman of the Veterans Council, okay. I don't think Bristol veterans encountered the kind of homecoming. Bristol Vietnam veterans didn't ex experience the kind of homecoming they, they might have gotten in other places. Good. I say that because Bristol is extremely supportive of its veterans. That has always been the case. So, my homecoming here was a lot better than the one I got over there in California. Let's put it that way. And do you find that a lot of men your age were also in the same situation as yourself coming home from Vietnam? I dare say, yeah. You know, the guys from Bristol, all they, they had the same experience. I think when they would, if they came, if they landed in California, they probably ran into the same crap I did. Okay, but when they came back to Bristol, 
And I was welcome home guy. You know? What did you do in the days and weeks after your discharge? Or after your <laughs> Here's a story I want to tell you. I spent I spent maybe eight months out in California before I actually got back to Connecticut. Okay. And uh, when I came home, I'm a newly married guy. Okay, well, I got married August of 1970, or I'll take that back in June of 1969. By August of 70, I was out of the service. Okay. I spent another eight months out there, and then I came home. And when I came home, I had hair. You gotta understand, this is the first time in my life where I could let my hair down, okay? Before I went to service, I had a very strict disciplinarian for a father. I went from that into the military, where obviously you don't get to let your hair down or anything like that, okay? So when I first got home, I walk up the front, front steps, my father's sitting on the front porch, He's got a little half pint of black velvet there, so he's probably about three sheets to the wind, okay? And I stand in front of him, and he looks at me, and this is what I have on. From bottom to top, I got on sandals, bell-bottom pants, no shirt, a Mexican serape, woven serape, a peace sign the size of my fist hanging around my neck, a ponytail that comes down to the middle of my back, an Indian woven headband, right, and pink octagon-shaped sunglasses. Now, my father looks at me, gives me, you know, gives me a little bit of this up and down, checks me out, and looks at me and goes, uh, I don't want any. You thought I was a peddler. I says, you don't want any what? And as soon as he heard my voice, he looked at his eyes guy about this big. He looked at me. What the hell happened to you? I says, Dad, I've been out in the Navy for eight months. I still remember what he looked. He looked me right in the eye. He goes, tells me to go back. Apparently, he wasn't too impressed with my new look. You know what I mean? But, but that's what I, I think. Basically, when I first got off active duty, that's what my goal was. I was going for the first time in my life. I was just going to let it all hang out, you know, throw it at the wall, see what sticks, you know what I mean, and just have a good time doing it. That was that was what I was going to do. So I had never had the opportunity to do that prior to that, so, you know. And I, and I did it. Believe me, I definitely did it. So, that's, uh, that's why we uh, ended up being kind of a wreck, too, 10 years later. So do you feel like you have any post-traumatic stress from the war? Do I? Yes. I did. I still think I have. I still have some. You know, I, 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 that would be a fair statement that I still have some. I uh, odd noises still wake me up at night. You know what I mean? If it's a noise I'm not familiar with or I'm, I'm not comfortable with, that'll get me up in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? I uh, I check my perimeter around the house every night, make sure all the windows are locked and whatever. I do that every night too. And uh, I might say that one of the reasons why I've been happily divorced for 39 years is probably because I have a tendency to keep everybody at arm's length. I don't, don't let anybody get too close. And the reason for that, I think, is because uh, that's, that's a carryover from overseas, too, because if you got too close to somebody, you never knew if they were going to be there the next day. So you tried, you know, you were friends. I mean, you were blood brothers, okay? But everybody stays at arm's length. Yeah. How do you deal with it? How do I? Yeah. I've been, like I say, I've been living alone for 39 years now. So to me, now it's just everyday business. You know what I mean? I don't think about it much. Once in a while, I'll think about, you know, getting old by myself. That's a little scary. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll admit that. But, you know, I usually uh, chase that out of my head shortly. You know? Besides, I mean, for me to try to get into a relationship with a woman that now, that woman would have to, would already have to have been canonized to put up with me, man. I'll tell you that right now. Thirty nine years be by yourself, you tend to be get a little inflexible, shall we say? 
I still want to get into my Army Reserve thing a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Okay. It's coming up. All okay. right. So uh, after your service, did you work or go back to school? I went right to work. Right to work. And what did you do for a living? Plumbing. 42 right. years. 42 years as a union plumber. And did you ever use the GI Bill to get any new... Um, no. Um, okay, certificate, sir. Okay. Nope. And did you make... That was a stupid move on my part, too, but I never did use it. And did you make any lasting friendships from the service? I know you just said you kept everybody at arm's length, but is there anything <coughs> that you write to Active duty? Stay in contact with? I only, I've only run into two people I even served with in Vietnam since, since that time. Have you been to any reunions? I've been invited to a lot of them. I have not gone to one yet. And, um, okay, so now is a good part to get into the Army Reserve. What did you, okay, so career as a plumber, and at what point did you join the Army Reserve? The end of 19, uh, let me rephrase that. July of 1980 is when I think, yeah, July of 1980 is when I went in. Okay, so you're 10 years out, and what caused you to come back? Well, we were, we, you and I were getting into this a little bit earlier. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jimmy Burns, and myself, we were both pretty heavy-duty substance abusers at the time. And uh, like I say, my marriage was already over. His was on the rocks. And uh, I had already been thinking about it, but had not acted on it, okay? And out of the clear blue sky, Jimmy comes out one day and says, what do you say we go back into the, go into the Army, Army Reserve, right? And because we both agreed to uh, the fact that we, if we were going to get our act back together again, we needed structure, okay? Show me an organization that will give you structure faster and more efficiently than Uncle Sam. You can't do it. That's the one thing they do better than anything else is provide somebody with structure. So now I, I wanted to go into the CB reserves because we were he was a carpenter and I was a plumber. I said, why don't we go into the CBs? He goes, no, nope, we're going to go in the Army Reserve. I said, okay. Then he wants to go and be a drill sergeant. I said, well, I said, how about if we start small, kind of work our way up to that one? He goes, nope, we're going to do it. We're going to go all the way. I said, man. Okay. Now, you got to remember. We haven't quit yet. We're still drinking, still smoking dope, and doing whatever, okay? He's, he joined up in June, I joined up in July of 80, okay? Now, the both of us pulled the pin at the end of 1980, okay? But, like when we went to our first drill, our very first drill was at West Point, Camp Smith. We had to qualify with weapons. He hadn't had a weapon in his hand since 1971. I hadn't had a weapon in my hand since 69. Okay, so we go down to West Point, all the way down to West Point in his van. We're drinking bush, smoking dope, eating speed. We never even went to sleep, okay? We go to our first drill. We get on the line, it's the old targets, 250 meters out. We're gonna roll them, lick them, and stick them targets where you, they put little stickers over the bullet holes because they, they don't have enough targets, okay? So they put little stickers over the bullet hole. They roll them up, you shoot, roll them down, cover the holes, roll it up again. They come off, off the pitch. And they want to know who's on point 38 and 40. Jim and I look at them. We are. Why? What's the problem? And they look at us. What are you guys, a couple of freaking snipers or what? Jimmy has shot 40 out of 40. I hit 38 out of 40. Jimmy looks at me and he goes, I think they're still coming through the wire, G-Man. I goes, yeah, I think they are still coming through the wire, but the bottom line was, when we started going to drill sergeant school, first thing they did was get us up and go start running, okay? And Jimmy's, Jimmy's problem when he drank, he didn't eat. So it got to the point where he was bleeding out of just about every orifice of his body, ended up going to the West Haven Veterans Hospital, okay? And while he was there, I made a little deal with my maker. I said, you know what? Jimmy walks out of that hospital, a healthy man, I'm all done, I'm wrapping it up, right? <laughs> Son of a gun come walking out of that hospital about a week later, you know what I'm saying? And uh, he was healthy, I said, okay, so. And we both quit one day apart. He quit December 30th, 1980, 
I quit on the stroke of midnight, December 31st, 1980. And we haven't uh, not had so much as a drink or a drop or anything since. Congratulations. Yep. Yep. And uh, I dare say what helps when you rehab like that, found this out to be the case, it helps to have goals. Something out in front of you that you're striving for, okay? In my case, it was being the best drill sergeant I could be. Same thing with Jimmy, okay? And uh, which, especially in my case, because if you compare my military jacket from when I was on active duty in the Navy and the one I had for 17 and a half years at the Army Reserve, you would swear you were reading about two different people, all right? Because on active duty, I was about as far from being a 4-0 CB as you could possibly be, whereas my my record in the reserves was exemplary, and if I may say so. I mean, I and I I, I love doing a job. I love doing a job. Drills. A lot of people think drill sergeant, and I, I want to make this point. I think being a drill sergeant is all about the power that comes with the position. And like anything else, you get good ones, you get bad ones. The bad ones are the ones who want to be drill sergeants solely because they get the power of the position. Okay. The good ones, like Jimmy, like myself, and a lot of the other ones that I worked with, okay, we understood that it was an opportunity to take a bunch of young men, no self-esteem, no self-confidence, afraid of anything even vaguely looks like a challenge, okay? Don't look you in the eye when they talk to you. Walk around all hunched over, okay? You take them from that point, and in eight weeks' time, they're standing straight as an arrow. They're looking you right in the eye when they talk to you. And your whole persona is, I'm Private Jones, and I got my shit wired tight. Go ahead, test my metal, man. I'm ready. And you made them, you helped them make that transition. How do you beat that? So what, did you go to a specific school to prepare you for being a drill instructor? Yes. And that was the way? way. Basically, it's like going to basic training all over again. Okay. I had a guy there, me and Jimmy, I'll tell you, it was tough. I was talking to a friend of mine about this earlier. Um, I'm 32. I got patches on my uniform that says, I, you know, been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. I got this guy who's 10 years my junior standing nose to nose with me, screaming in my face. And, you know... If I didn't want that round brown as badly as I did, I probably would have just hauled off and clocked this clown, okay? But I had a goal. You know, you know what, Timmy? You're going to put up with this. You're going to play the game. You're going to get that round brown, okay? When you got the round brown, I mean, that was an opportunity for me. Another thing I used to do as a drill sergeant, too, I used to, uh, when you got downtime, now you don't get a lot of downtime in basic training, but you do get some here and there, Okay. Two things I'd beat into these guys. One was the disadvantages of substance abuse. I would let them know I was a recovering substance abuser. The regular Army drill sergeants would always get on my case and tell me I shouldn't do that, that it would undermine my authority. I said, do me a favor. Shut up, because you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? Half of those kids, I guarantee you, half of those kids in that platoon, they're joining the military because they're probably surrounded by dope, drugs, and everything else, and they're, and they're joining the military to get away from that. Or they've already dabbled in it and want to get away from it. I'm standing in front of them. I'm a living, breathing example that, yes, you can get away from drugs. You can make something of yourself. Just look at me. It can happen. All right? I'm the best example they could possibly have. I used to beat that into them, and the other thing I used to beat into them was... Uh, I and me, we and us. I used to hammer them about that, okay? I had a kid, uh, Private Jones. He was my platoon, platoon guy. He had a real knack for putting together cadences, songs, and the like. So I asked him to put together a song or a model that had to do with I and me versus we and us. I want to share this with you because I have it hanging on my living room wall still, framed. 24 hours later, after I tasked him with this, which means in one day, he put it together and practiced it with the platoon so that they were ready for me at first formation the very next day. 
he asked me, he's a drill sergeant, ask the wolf pack, what is the rule? So, okay, and he's a squared away, he's a squared away troop. I said, I'll play, I'll go along with it. So I called the wolf pack to attention and I asked him, I said, okay, wolf pack, tell me exactly, what is the rule? Okay. This is what I hear next, very loudly, very much in harmony. Okay. I, me, my, mine. These are words that do not rhyme. We, us, our, together, these are the words that last forever. This cold, unemotional, stoic drill sergeant, I found myself having to turn my back in that platoon for a moment to, to make sure I had maintained my composure because these guys had just punched me right between my running lights. I had 50 guys standing in front of me, okay? We were gonna go out into that world getting it. You know, that's, this is it. And one step further, I ran into one of my privates. Oh man, it had to be 15 years after I had him in basic training. I was at a retirement party. His name was Vargas, V-A-R-G-A-S. I still remember him. He was in uniform at the retirement party and he looked familiar to me. I'm looking at him, boy, I really know this guy. I can't place him, I can't remember where I know him from. He comes up to me at the, at the retirement party and asks me if I remember him. I says, I do remember you, what, how do I remember you? He goes, you were my drill sergeant. I says, oh man. That's the only time I've ever run into one of the guys I had at, at basic training. But what he told me afterwards, he had been clean and sober since basic training, where he wasn't when he joined the military. Okay? He had been dabbling around. Okay? And he says, after having you for a drill sergeant, he says, I want you to know I've been clean and sober since I got out of basic training. Here's the reason why. I got to tell you, that, that one statement made 10 years of Going to bed at midnight, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, working on three hours of sleep for eight weeks every summer for 10 years, that, that one guy made it all worth the while. And that's all I'll say about that. So, these experiences, how have they shaped your opinion of the military and about war in general? About war? I have different opinions about them. Okay. okay. How do they make you okay. Feel you know, remember I told you about that tour of duty or tour of the monuments that the high school kids go on in the city of Bristol, okay? I make a point to try and impress upon these kids that every time they solve their issues with someone through the use of force, whether it's with their their hands, their feet, a weapon, God forbid, okay? that they're lowering, the first off, they're lowering themselves to the level of the rest of the, the animal kingdom because they have to fight for food, territory, a mate, whatever, okay? I said, you might as well join the rest of the animal kingdom every time you do that. I said, but here's, here's the thing I want you to think about. I said, take that little scenario that I just gave you, two guys duking it out, okay? And take it out to its largest manifestation. What do you have? I let them think about it for a second. Invariably, one of them will get it. They'll say war. So that's right. I says, but war is always waged by people who never fight it. Think about that. I says, whoever decides that they're going to go to war, those two people or those two bodies, whoever they are, okay, make that decision, they never ever fight it. They send you out to fight it. They send me out to fight it, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to get into the frame of mind that Rather than solving your issues, your issues with somebody through the use of force, in whatever form they might take, I said, how about if we try and utilize the power of reasoning that God gave us? Talk it out. Excuse me. Negotiate. Okay, that's, that's the answer, because I can tell you this much. You talk to any veteran, especially the ones who have been under fire, okay. 
there's one common denominator they all have, they all share. Okay? They come away from that experience understanding one thing for sure. Namely, that there has to be a better way for nations to solve their issues with one another other than trying to blow one another off the face of the planet. There has to be a better way to do it. But now, when you say the military, you're going to love this being a college student. Okay? I'm of the mindset that every single American, male or female, should do a stint in the military at least two years. And I say that, and I say that for a reason. I don't, not because I want to see them go off to war, okay? But because I think they need exposure to the idea of service. Exposure to the idea of serving something greater or larger than themselves. Okay? Once, how many more people do you think would choose a life of service, whether it's in the military, whether it's the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, or missionary work? How many more people do you think would do that if they were just exposed to it? My thought is, once they're exposed to it and they see the, kind, the sense of reward that it gives you, the sense of contribution that it gives you, they're going to want more of it. They're going to want more of it. Okay? And it teaches you respect. It teaches you punctuality. Okay? Take two guys applying for a job. Okay? One's a college student. Okay? They both have the same exact amount of education. Same courses, everything's exactly the same, okay? A, never was in the military, B, was. I'm the employer. What do you think I'm going to choose first? Why? Because when a job says you start at 8 o'clock in the morning, it doesn't mean 8.30. It means 8 o'clock. If it means you go to lunch at 10 or 12, it doesn't mean 11.30. It means 10 to 12. And they know how to work and play well with others. Okay, and last but not least, okay, through their experiences in the military, chances are really good that they already possess some leadership capabilities. Whereas that person who's never had people in his charge, they might be a good leader, but you don't know that yet because they've never, never had the opportunity to do it. Whereas that military person, I can almost guarantee you, especially if they've been in for a length of time where they've, they've made it to the a non-commissioned officer. They've made it to E4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, okay? Or they're officers, okay? They've had people in their charge. Okay? I think it's an experience every single kid should have. And on top of that, one last part of that, that one last piece of that. Some of that tour of duty should be spent in a place where the chosen form of government is not representative government, like it is here. Let them get a good look at what it's like to live in a place where you go out on the street, you say the president is a bum, your family never gets to see you again because they have no idea what happened to you. Okay? I guarantee you, when you come away from that, the one thing you're going to do, you're going to vote. I have not missed an election ever, ever, since I've been old enough to vote. Okay, because to me, the people that piss me off the most, they'll sit there and rail against everything. Okay, when they get all done, I'll ask them one question: Did you vote? No. I, conversation's over with, pal. Okay, what makes you think you've earned the right to complain? What thinks you? What makes you think you've had the right to complain when you don't even participate in the process? You're letting somebody else. You're, you're advocating your responsibility to somebody else. No, man. You know what I mean? Once you vote, once you participate in the process, now nah, if you want to rail, hey, knock yourself out. You've earned the right to do so. Sorry about that, man. You, you got me on my soapbox there for a second. No worries there. Um, now you said you joined the American Legion. Yes. You joined any other American veterans? I am a member of the Disabled American Veterans, American Legion, Polish Legion of American Veterans, Franco-American veterans. 
and the chairman of the Veterans Council in Bristol. None of which happens until like 1998, I might add. They had the uh, traveling wall come to Bristol back in 98. I think you might remember that. Um, up to that, I had been retired from the military for a year. Mm, hadn't really thought about joining any, any organizations, but the guy who was in charge of the, the wall thing found out that I was not a member of any veterans organizations, and boy, he just... Man, I think it was more attrition than anything else. I got tired of the guy bugging me. I says, okay, okay, gee whiz, I'll join, all right? Because every time he saw me, he'd be hammering me about, you know. As soon as I got involved, that was it. I just took off from right there, I guess. I went so far as to run for city council last election, too. Got my head handed to me, but, you know. And once again, you know what I mean? Got to get a little skin in the game, you know what I mean? If you're gonna gonna make changes, you can't do it from the house. You gotta you gotta get into the batter's box, if you know what I mean. Who dares wins? What's that? Who dares wins? That's right. Our decisions are made by those who show up. Now, uh, how has your military service and your experiences in the service affected your life? I. Good question. Okay, I dare say. I couldn't sit here and tell you that I have been a recovering substance abuse for 31 years. I wouldn't be able to say that to you if I hadn't gone back into the military. That played a huge, that and going back to church, church is a big part of my life too, okay? But going into the military, learning some responsibility again, learning some discipline again, okay? And uh, getting the opportunity to, especially being a drill sergeant, that, that 10 years of my life, I have to tell you, I feel was the most rewarding 10 years of my life. I say that because I think I contributed more. I mean, the way I look at it is, I mean, how, do you, how can you call yourself a responsible adult and not try to help out young kids to keep them from making the same mistakes you made? You know, and as a drill sergeant, that gave me a unique opportunity. OK, it's not like public school where, you know, the kid can go, oh, I don't want to go in today. You know, and just lay over and roll over and hit the sleeper button or just turn it off altogether. OK, Uncle Sam, there is none of that. OK, I have a captive audience for eight weeks every summer. OK, and for eight weeks every summer. You know, I mean, the way I look at it, if there's anything I can say, anything I can do, to help these kids from making the same mistakes I made? I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna do it. Now, is there anything you'd like to add to this session that you haven't covered yet in this interview? Any stories that come to mind? Anything that's you know, gotten on hate while we nah. about your service? One. Okay. Humorous antidote, if I will. Here we are. Private Cook. My three-year college man. Okay. He uh, marched five and a half miles from bivouac to the range one day with two left boots on his feet. And then when we got to the range, he told me his foot was hurting him. So when I looked at his boots and I saw them both going like that, I mean, I knew it. Was done. So I told him, I said, when you figure it out, you let me know, Private Cook. And I walk away. So he's looking at me, looking at my feet, looking at me. Finally, raises his hand like we're in class or something, okay? I said, well, this isn't a school, okay? What's up, Private Cook? He whispers to me, Control Sergeant, I think I have two left boots on. Now, you know what my response is. My response is to sound off like you got a pair, damn it. Okay, so now he says it out loud. Strozo, I have two left boots on. Now the rest of the platoon, you have to understand, if they start laughing, I'm going to smoke them. We don't laugh at our own. We don't point fingers. We encourage. We abet. We help out. We encourage. Okay, okay. Other platoons, they're fair game, but within our platoon, no pointing fingers, no laughing at anybody. Right. 
So I got 49 guys standing there turning blue in the face ones, trying not to laugh because this guy's walking around with two left boots on his feet. Next day, I had him take one of his right boots, about yay much of the laces, tie it into one of the buttons on his blouse. So he had a right boot banging off his chest everywhere we went for 18 hours just to remind him that there was at least one right boot somewhere in that pup tent had, and he better be finding one each from now on. <laughs> but I'll conclude with this. First off, I, I want to conclude by expressing my appreciation to what you're doing. You know, giving the veterans the opportunity to tell their stories. You know, good, bad, or in between, whatever they are. Okay. Um, this gave me the opportunity to tell you why I, th I thought being a drill sergeant was so rewarding. To tell you why I thought military service was important for young people to experience. Okay. Why uh, war is something to be avoided. This gave me a it gave me a forum to say all those things. So, your experiences, <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for devoting your life to service, as well as taking the time today to participate in this interview. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, and thank you, sir. And I'd also like to add, welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>